Welcome to the Myopia Podcast, where we give you the latest myopia research, clinical topics, and industry insights. Make sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all awesome myopia content. And now to our host, a massive myopia manager himself, Dr. David Kading. Hey friends, Dave Kading. Uh, before we get into the show, I wanted to mention that team has supported this particular podcast and I'm really grateful for them reaching out to us. And they mentioned that they would like to give uh, members of the Myopia podcast community a $250 discount off of their first virtual assistant. If you have not considered uh, bringing in a virtual team, uh, I can attest to how wonderful it is. Over the last two years, we've brought in uh, about 10 team members onto our uh, practice. We've used different staffing services and we've had issues over the years with our staff not getting paid, having issues here or there, issues with the communication. And that has been really taken care of since we've joined up with team and their uh, their group of virtual people. Uh, it's been fantastic and I would highly recommend that you consider doing it for your office. They can do things by answer the phone for you. They can uh, check uh, insurances. They can give patients calls. They can check on uh, scribing for you in the exam room and do a host of different things. Particularly in the myopia community, it's great to have somebody that can be in charge of these sort of things, checking on those myopic patients, seeing how they're doing, giving them a care call after they've had orthokeratology for a day, uh, and just kind of be a right hand to you in the exam room or to your billing team or your front desk. Consider higher team.com, H-I-R-E-T-E-E-M.com, or click the show notes to get the $250 discount when you sign up. Now back to the show. Thank you for joining us again for this episode. Uh, I am excited to be here with uh, Monica Jung, and we're going to be speaking um, about J&J and what's happening in the world of myopia management globally. Uh, but uh, first, I want to mention we are at the Vision by Design meeting in the exhibit hall, podcasting live from the meeting. If you have not ever attended the Vision by Design, this is North America's premier myopia management meeting where we talk about myopia management and orthokeratology. And uh, we will be at the Vision by Design 2024 meeting, which is going to be October 2nd through the 5th in Dallas. Be a little bit easier for you to get to, uh, Dr. And um, so make sure to be making plans for that meeting and uh, we will look forward to seeing you there. So, Monica, thanks for hanging out with me again. It's a pleasure to be here, Dr. Kading. Yeah, last time we spoke, you were in Australia. You were still executive director of the IMI, and uh, you shared with us about the IMI. What an incredible organization. And uh, since then, you have had some role changes. Share with us what's, uh, what's happening. Yes, it's really been exciting. I took the leap from moving from more of a non-profit and academic research type role to now joining Johnson & Johnson Vision. And I'm now the global professional education lead in myopia. So, you know, this role is about building and creating the professional education strategy and all the programs that is necessary to uh, build the myopia category around the world and yeah. educate practitioners to support them on their myopia management journey. Yeah. So it's really, really exciting because my previous roles before joining Johnson & Johnson were about um, professional education and advocating in this area. But now I'm more focused on actually developing practitioners so that they can confidently do myopia management with their patients. So it's about reaching more practitioners and really continuing the work. And now that, I'm jo that I've joined Johnson & Johnson Vision, it means that I'm able to uh, leverage the Johnson & Johnson Vision professional e education networks, which are huge and global, mm -hmm. and have those resources to really reach everybody, all the optometrists out there, and eventually even reach you know, the medical profession and work with the wider team to drive the awareness with the general public. Yeah, yeah. so give us an idea of, um, you know, over a, a week or a month's period on the global scale outside of North America, like what are some of the initiatives that you are working with within J&J &J on myopia? So 
We're trying to do a lot of things because we realise every piece fits together to make this puzzle. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I'm working with teams around the world to really understand the professional education needs, what the practitioner wants in their treatments. And it could be, it could be from spectacles or even ortho K and soft contact lenses because our approach to myopia management is not about one product or one treatment. Johnson and Johnson's approach is that to manage myopia, which we consider as a disease, we need to be approaching it by looking at the child, all their clinical factors, their lifestyle and patient preferences, and then going to choose the treatment. So the way Johnson and Johnson is educating is about educating again about every single um, myopia management option. And eventually we're going to come out with a comprehensive portfolio of sure. treatments. So it's not just going to be, you know, a soft contact lens. So right now in some places outside of the US, we have approval for uh, myopia management for our Ability One Day soft contact lens. Yep. And that is really an amazing new piece of technology. Mm-hmm. We have six month data of that published and that has been published in a ophthalmology peer reviewed journal. And this technology is called ring focus because what it is is it has some concentric rings that are uh, containing plus seven diopters of treatment power and then a plus 10 diopter central boost. So it's not like a traditional concentric ring contact lens. Right, where because you're little ads, right? That's, that's right. A huge There's ad. actually not considered an ad sure, even. Sure, yeah. Because the light rays come into the rings and then they're focused in a ring around the optical axis. Mm. So it's not even on the visual axis. Mm-hmm. And then the plus 10 diopter boost is on the visual axis. Mm-hmm. So it means that, you know, there's a huge volume of light kind of in a donut ring shape around the visual axis. And mm-hmm. the study is reporting that the in, even in six months, the difference in axial length slowing was 0.105 millimeters compared to single vision. So that's pretty significant. Yeah. And then the vision's good. We've seen that lens already is available outside the United States. So it's already being placed on patients. Patients are are using it. We don't have it yet in the United States. It's not FDA cleared, but it is available outside the United States. Yeah, in some countries outside of the U.S., like in Canada. Yes. And, I mean, it's great that there's now another option available. Mm -hmm. Um, It just means that parents have the opportunity to select from a range of treatments to suit the child's lifestyle. And this one is is in a in the oasis material yeah. so it's you know high decay and really good handling mm-hmm. and the diameter of the lens is smaller than your usual one so it's a diameter yeah. of 13.8 millimeters okay okay um i want to uh, i, I want to ask you um how your perspective of the way we think about myopia management in north america is different as you think about myopia management across the world. You've got a, obviously with a global role, you know, myopia management is all over the place as you go around the world. We fortunately have listeners all over the world, which just surprises me, but it's very different country to country. And how do you approach that with J and J? I'm sure there's countries, in, you know, you, that you focus more on, but how have you seen that uh, that change over the last couple of years? Yeah, like it is, it is quite different around the world because it's about the awareness level, even amongst the general public, but even amongst practitioners. Because in some countries, such as China or Singapore and Hong Kong, the practitioners are very aware of myopia yeah. because they see such a high prevalence. You know, in those places, eighty to ninety percent of the children are myopic. Mm-hmm. And so the practitioners are very used to having a conversation about myopia. And in those markets or regions, they already have ortho K, they've, got, they've now got myopia control specs, and they've also got soft contact lenses for myopia control. Now, in those regions, ortho K is actually the most popular treatment option in mm-hmm. Hong Kong and China. And so there is no need to really uh, really go through and you know convince parents that it's a really good treatment option mm-hmm. because it's quite you know it's something that a lot of parents are familiar with and 
the only challenge is in those regions when you know other treatments are available it's probably trying to talk to parents and say hey there's other treatments available you might yeah. want to consider these things because parents are more aware about ortho k yeah and then in other parts of the world such as uh, the us you do have practitioners who work in places where their demographics may not have many children with myopia and they those practitioners might might be saying well you know i'm not seeing that many children with myopia is this really is an this issue really and you know people say that to me but then you know there are studies in the us such as the vitali data that's saying that you know about 42% of americans now mm -hmm. have myopia so there is myopia and i think practitioners need to be aware that just because it's not they're not seeing those patients in their chair. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist because you can talk to your colleagues who practice in a different part of the US and they're getting a lot of myopia. So I think it's, it's I think just talking to your colleagues at conferences and reading trade magazines that talk about myopia, like review of myopia management or even myopia profile, you know, you can just keep up with the latest literature. Yeah. Um, I, I've got a, a, a difficult question uh, in my mind. Uh, so years ago, there was a, 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 a pullback on soft contact lenses in, in China and in, in, in Hong Kong. And for that reason, there's not a lot of people wearing soft lenses in those countries. And that's possibly one of the major reasons that orthokeratology has caught on as a much bigger fix for so many people. The regulatory around soft lenses as you may buy them at other places but they're it's a little bit it's a little bit uh seen as not an ideal thing for patients in china and other parts of the world to wear soft lenses is it uh is is it one of those things where that's an uphill battle for j and j if they're thinking about bringing a soft multifocal into those countries or do you just go down the route of orthokeratology in a country like that? How do you look at that from a global perspective when you're thinking about that for J&J? &J? Yeah, that's a really uh, good question. Ortho-K is always going to have a huge place in parts of you know, China and, and other parts of Asia. However, if we really want to address the myopia epidemic and have everyone, every child offered something, I think soft contact lenses are part of the solution just mm -hmm. because they are easier to fit in general. Mm -hmm. I know that our lens is just fit based on the spherical refraction and mm -hmm. it's very simple, just on the eye and that's it. And then J&J &J realizes that it's going to take a lot of professional education to um, you know, engage the practitioners to consider soft lenses as a viable treatment. But I think if we have the data to demonstrate that the soft lenses are going to be able to do as much myopia control as the ortho K lens. Um, we're going to go out there having the right professional education and the resources and the videos that demonstrate insertion and removal to make it easy for the practitioner to adopt. I think it's going to, it's going to eventually, soft lenses are going to be eventually seen as a mainstream type of treatment. I mean, you know, the convincing parents that, uh, there's less risk with daily disposable lenses. I think that's a key thing. And at the moment, I guess ortho K lenses are only offered in certified hospitals in China as right. well. So right. that kind so, of, yeah. yeah, that kind of gives ortho K that kind of platform mm -hmm. as well. So I think there's all these things that we will be looking at to address, but, yeah. but it's about partnering with the organizations, the associations in those countries and listening to them and yeah. understanding the culture, I think. Well, within your role, the cultural differences, the regulatory differences, the perspectives around treatment, where people can get them, uh, optometry, ophthalmology, opticians, all across the world. That is a, that is a major undertaking. I, 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 you're the right person for the job because you understand it in such a, a degree, but it's uh, not, a, uh, not a small undertaking to make myopia mainstream globally. Right. Yeah. And and the thing is, in in a lot of markets with just more treatments coming to the market from a wider variety of companies, it actually makes myopia management a more legitimate um, condition or myopia a more legitimate condition. And 
um, especially with the medical professions and health departments, they see, well, you know, all these companies are coming to the forefront with their innovations. And then at the same time, Johnson & Johnson has a has an incredible um, reputation in China. People trust the Johnson & Johnson brand mm -hmm. for safety and innovation. So I think even, even if Johnson Johnson goes to those markets with a soft lens, I think it's going to mean something different. Yeah. Well, we have to understand from the perspective of we've tried as small industry partners, as I look around this amazing exhibit hall, we've got some amazing companies, but they're smaller companies. They've made a huge dent in the universe. Um, and having a company like Cooper Vision or Johnson & Johnson coming into the market and launching in the myopia space could be seen as a threat. But the reality is that it raises the awareness so high that not only are way more patients treated because of Cooper Vision and Johnson & Johnson, but it ends up that all of these other industry people gain so much and more practitioners get more tools. It's better for the myopic community. And by and large, it really raises the entire tide for everybody. So I'm very grateful that there's companies like J&J &J and Cooper Vision leading the charge with the resources, the knowledge, and as you stated, the reputation, whereas it may be very difficult for some of these other companies to be able to make that dent yeah. in those places. Like right now, some of the key things that even at this meeting that practitioners are telling us about is that how do they get to those patients that haven't even got myopia yet, right? Mm -hmm. People who are pre kids who are pre that are at pediatricians. How does the optometrist get in the door with the pediatrician to talk about themselves and what they do in myopia management so that the child ends up going on the right path? Mm -hmm. Because we have to, we have to identify those kids as soon as we can. We can't be waiting for, you know, as soon as they have myopia, we should be managing them. We shouldn't be waiting for progression. And that was one of the, the well, that was the talk that I gave this morning yes. with Dr. Brianna Rue. And I shared some of the insights from J&J &J Research into this area where we surveyed uh, pediatricians online. In the US today, there are 33,000 pediatricians and only about 1,000 pediatric ophthalmologists. Mm -hmm. Now, if each of those pediatricians did a, a vision screening on a child and each one of them referred one child a day, that's 33,000 children a day that need an eye examination. And how is how are the pediatric ophthalmologists going to address this? You know, can we have kids who may have myopia be waiting months for an eye exam? You know, it, it makes sense that optometry comes into this as part of, you know, collaborative care and supporting the public health. We yeah. have a huge role to play here. And Johnson & Johnson is really committed to supporting the development of this collaborative care. We are we have a new program where we're going to be strategically engaging pediatricians and pediatric ophthalmologists, at least talking to them about why myopia matters. And then even having that conversation about, well, contact lenses and ortho-K may play a role in, in the actual management of a child because of children's lifestyles. Children can wear spectacles, of course, but a lot of children are active playing sports and swimming. So those children, we should actually consider them holistically. Yeah. So at least the ophthalmologists and the pediatricians know, hey, myopia is something that should be managed and we should be referring a child for myopia management. And it's not just a conversation about low-dose atropine. There are myopia management spectacles today. There's orthokeratology and there's soft contact lenses for myopia control as well. And so as long as we have that conversation and educate our medical colleagues so that they don't see contact lenses and ortho K as something that's they, that they won't just say, no, it's not a solution. I think that's incredibly important. And, you know, Johnson & Johnson has now got the Ability Myopia brochures in the Johnson & Johnson baby bundle box. So this mm -hmm. is a box that goes to every single pediatrician's office to be given to new parents. And this Mopia brochure sits alongside big name baby brand products. So once again, 
that helps the whole profession. It's starting the conversation. Exactly. It's raising the awareness. You know, I have high prescription as a parent, and oh, there's something that could be done for my child. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because uh, I was literally having a conversation earlier today with a doctor who is telling me when I go next door to the pediatric pediatrician's office and speak to their six pediatricians, they, uh, they don't want to give me the time of day and they don't really agree with this or believe this because they haven't seen all of the data, right? And it's, uh, it's where those doors are open that, you know, J&J can help open those doors when it's like, well, there are solutions to these problems. This is a big problem. And, you know, we can go in and slap down studies and stuff with, with, with them. But it really is one of those things where, you know, a gentle approach, but also the partnership when parents are asking about it, when pediatricians are telling people about it, when pediatric ophthalmologists are on board with us, that we really start to see that tipping point happen and people are walking in the door asking for it as opposed to us presenting it in a why have I never heard of this? Well, you know, seven years from now when those babies that are born today are walking into our office, that parent may think back of, oh, there may be of something that we could have done. And I'm really, really excited because, I mean, the next stage of what I'm planning to do in my role at Johnson & Johnson is to build that pediatric ophthalmologist engagement strategy and the pediatrician engagement strategy with other medical doctors in collaboration with optometrists. Wow. We're going to be embarking on this huge, huge effort yeah. and we're going to be piloting and testing this in the US first. Yeah. So it's going, to, it's going to really have huge impacts downstream and that's what I'm excited about, these possibilities that we're going to be creating these children who would never have been identified early who are going to now get treatment. So there's going to be a lot of children coming in the doors of yeah. optometrists who are going to now receive the care that they wouldn't have. Yeah. I think uh, a back 15 years ago and Brian Holden was talking about myopia being an issue and he started this little snowball starting to spin, right? And I think we in the last five years have seen that that snowball is making a big deal, right? We've seen the launch of major products. We've seen uh, um, initiatives being launched. And uh, I am just excited how the doubling of that effort is going to take fewer years. And in five years from now, these efforts that like you're putting into place will completely change the landscape of where we're going to be in myopia management five years from now. Yeah, I'm, I'm really, really excited about this. And, you know, the whole world is going to benefit because I'm working across the world. Right. I've had the experience of visiting all parts of the world, doing clinical trials and meeting practitioners and speaking at meetings, visiting hospitals and optometrist offices. I understand each region, what the scope of practice is, whether it's an optometrist, um, optometrist doing the myopia management or in other countries where there is no optometry it is ophthalmology or in other countries where there's a skills shortage it will be optical shops mm -hmm. and you know collaborating mm -hmm. so I understand what we need to do in these different places and it's about listening to those countries the people and the ODs in the country understanding them and you know working with those cultures to give them a solution that actually works with them we should ultimately be able to make myopia management the standard of care and for most practitioners they they want to do something that is going to be able to fit in with their workflow whatever right. that workflow might mean in different settings or different yeah. countries mm -hmm. and and the majority of the myopia that we see is the standard type of myopia so there's going to be a, lo a lot of that so let's, let's have solutions that are easy for people to use mm -hmm. and accessible. And the more companies that come out with treatments, it's actually going to make it affordable in the long term. And there's always going to be the really interesting cases where you can probably refer to the colleague who loves to do the customized ortho K fitting and all those kinds of things. So I think everyone is really going to be part of this movement long term. Yeah. And we're also seeing like, you know, new associations with myopia, like kids are doing a lot of screen time, even though screen times haven't been shown to, uh, to cause myopia, 
or increase its progression, there's some kind of association. But we also know that there's a lot of reports now that kids are also getting dry eye. Kids with myopia have dry eye. So it also opens up the other things that we need to do as practitioners yeah. to manage myopia. We need to consider the child's dry eye and manage that too. Yeah. So I think it's it's an area that's really fascinating and interesting and it, the knowledge base keeps growing. Yeah. Seems like a reasonable place to focus our efforts for the next couple of years, at least. Yeah, I yeah, agree. I don't think we're going to get bored. Yeah. Well, thank you for what you're doing and how you're changing the world for so many millions of patients and practitioners around the world. Uh, I'm really glad for you being in this new role and getting to hear about what you're doing. And thanks for being on the podcast. Thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. And thank you for joining me for this episode of the Myopia Podcast. Make sure to like and subscribe. Stay tuned for future episodes. And again, the Vision by Design meeting 2024. Make, uh, make plans to be in, Oct uh, in Dallas in October, the 2nd through the 5th. And uh, Dr. Monica and I will be looking forward to uh, hanging out with you there. All right. Thank you, Dr. Jung, for being with us. All right. Take care. Thanks for listening to this episode. I want to again thank Team for their support of this particular podcast. Uh, they have been a great supporter of the myopia community, helping to uh, make clinicians and offices run better, whether it's calling and scheduling appointments, whether it's answering the phone, helping with billing issues, scribing in the exam room, whatnot. Having a virtual team member in your practice is a real show stopper. So with that, I want to thank team again for their support. Check them out at hireteam.com. That's H-I-R-E-T-E-M.com or click the notes in the show description below. Thanks again to team. One, two, three, four. Thank you for tuning in to the Myopia Podcast. If you enjoy our content, please leave a five-star review and don't forget to subscribe for more great episodes.